And welcome back to the cloudchurch.org. Uh, my name is Robert Breaker, missionary evangelist of Spanish and English speaking people. And we're going verse by verse through our King James Bibles in the epistles of Paul in order of when they are written. And we are now in Galatians chapter 3. We just went from verse 1 to verse 3. So we didn't get too far in our last study. So we'll begin in verse 4. Just a quick recap. We've looked at the difference between the law and grace and how in the church age we're under grace and how Paul is bawling these people out because they've allowed someone to come in and try to tell them you're not saved by faith alone you have to keep the law and we saw last time maybe I'll go ahead and write it back up here that the law you do in the flesh and its works of the flesh but under the church age we walk in the spirit because we're saved by faith and we receive the Holy Spirit by faith. So it's so important to see the difference between the law and grace. One is doing something in the flesh, and the other is trusting in what's already done and walking in the Spirit of God that He gives to you. It's one of the best times in history to be, bo to be born and to live in is the time of the church age. Because salvation is so simple. It's simply receiving the free gift of eternal life that Jesus offers. When back here, you had to do the law, do the law, do the law. It had to do works. And the law was demanding, so demanding. But the Bible says that Christ is the end of the law to all who believe. Romans chapter 10 and verse 4. We are no longer under the law, but under grace. So, continuing on here in, in verse 4, Paul says, Have you suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? So, Paul is saying, I stand in doubt of you. You know, you're all letting people come in and lie to you and tell you, No, this isn't enough. You've got to come back to the law. But he said that you suffered. Well, what was it they suffered? Well, let's look at that. Because when you become a Christian, you do suffer. Jesus Christ suffered. As a matter of fact, I think it's interesting. The first word out of the mouth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in the Bible is suffer. I think that's so interesting. I believe that's in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 15. Jesus shows up, and the first thing that Jesus says in the New Testament in the book of Matthew, it's found in Matthew 3.15, And Jesus answered unto him, Suffer it to be so now. For thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. The first word out of the mouth of Jesus Christ was suffer. And that's what Christians have been doing for millennium. After Jesus Christ, they have been suffering for their faith. Now we live in America, and in America there's very little persecution, but we're starting to see it. We're starting to see a lot more suffering for the name of Christ. So Jesus said, suffer. And Paul says, you guys have suffered. He said, but have you suffered in vain? He's trying to say, hey, think about this. What have you suffered for? What were you suffering for when you chose Jesus Christ as your Savior and you began to suffer? What were you suffering for? Well, who was persecuting them? Well, the persecution that they were feeling was from the, those Jewish people that were under the law. So it was the law and the Jewish people who followed the law that made them suffer. So who was the persecuting people? The religious crowd that said, oh, you got to keep the law. They were persecuting. You see, the law is strict. The law is a, is a master, a slave master, a slave driver, if you will. So don't get under the law because the law can't save you. So it says, are you so foolish? We began last time by looking at uh, Galatians 1, uh, 3, 1, where he says, Oh, foolish Galatians. He says, You foolish Galatians. And then again in verse 3, he says, Are you so foolish? He, it's like Paul is saying, That's the dumbest, most foolish thing I've ever heard, telling someone they've got to keep the law for salvation. When Paul was born under the law, <laughs> and Paul, because he believed in the law so much, he persecuted the early Christians. He made them suffer. But yet, when he saw the truth of, of grace under the church age, where we're saved by grace and not of works, he said, this is awesome. This is wonderful. This is what it is. It's grace. Now, I'm going to suffer for what Jesus did for me. So when you're a Christian, you, you almost always are going to suffer persecution from the lost religious crowd who tries to force what they believe on you and say, you've got to do what we say. You've got to keep our laws. You've got to do what we say. And how sad that most modern so-called Christian circles don't understand that salvation is all about Jesus and what he did. Now let's look at some of this suffering. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 11. And Galatians 5.11 says, 
And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. You see, it was the people who were circumcised that were telling them they had to be circumcised to keep the law. If you remember when we started in Galatians chapter 1, in verse, or chapter 1 and verse chapter 2, actually chapter 2, how there were false brethren, 2 verse 4, brought in other wares to spy out our liberty in Christ. And they were preaching that you had to be circumcised to be a follower of Jesus. So they were preaching you have to keep the law, but you have to Jesus trust Jesus. So they were saying that you have to believe in faith plus works. Are we saved by faith plus works? No, we're saved by grace through faith. Faith is what saves. I've got it up here. And not works. Over here they taught, oh, works have to save you. So, who was doing the persecution? Those that were under the law were persecuting those that were under grace. Now that's interesting because we'll learn later about the bondwoman and the free as we get to chapter 4. And how that's a type of the law versus those that are free and how they always are getting persecuted from those under the law. Galatians chapter 5, we just read, and I forgot to read verse 12. So, Galatians 5.11, And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross cease. The cross is an offense. It's an offense to the people that think I can get to heaven by my works. Until they come to Jesus and realize my works won't save me, then the offense is taken care of and they come to Jesus. But those who think they can work to their heaven are offended that Jesus says, Oh, I'm more righteous than you. And they don't realize they're telling God, No, I'm more righteous than you, Jesus. And that's crazy. So verse 12, I would they were even cut off, which trouble you. The Apostle Paul says, I wish they would just leave you alone. I wish they were dead that are coming in there and stirring you up. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1 and 2. Excuse me, 6.12. Galatians 6.12. As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised. Only thus they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire you, desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh. There we go, all back to the flesh. So these people over here are coming over here and saying, you've got to keep the law. You've got to get circumcised. And yet they themselves can't even keep the law. But what do they want? They want a glory in your flesh. They want, well, it's kind of like this. <laughs> You go to many churches today, and, and you'll find in that church on the wall, you'll find a little thing that says, Attendance last Sunday, and then they'll have a number. Attendance this Sunday, and then they'll have a number. And then they'll say, How many have had baptized this year? You know? And, and, then, and you go in there, and that whole church is about numbers. It's all so they can have a show in the flesh and say, Look how many we are. Look at all the numbers we have. And that's what many people and many denominations have turned into is number counters. And all they care about is getting people baptized so they can brag, look how many we had baptized this year. And it's almost like that Old Testament, look how many we had circumcised this year. That's what it's doing. It's them wanting to brag upon themselves instead of wanting to brag on Jesus Christ. So you've got to watch out. If you go to a church or you know of a church and all they want to do is brag on the numbers, then you've got a bad church. You've got a church that's almost like the one in Galatians where bad people have come in and tried to put the emphasis on the flesh, on look what we're doing, rather than putting the emphasis on look what Christ did for us. So they suffered from Jews for not following the law. Now, go back to Galatians. Have you suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? Well, if you're trusting Christ, then it's never in vain. You know for sure that what you're doing, there's a reason for it. Uh, let's go to 2 Timothy 3.12. I've got a really big footnote next to this verse in my Bible, so it's worth a look. So 2 Timothy 3.12. 2 Timothy 3.12 tells us, Yea, and all, I like that word, all, a l well, let's put it down here with suffer. A-L-L. -L. Yea, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. It says, verse 13, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. 
But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of them, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. So, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall be, suffer persecution. So I got a question. Are you a Christian? Alright, how much persecution are you suffering? None? What? None? Well, uh, are you godly? <laughs> This is all that live godly in Christ Jesus. Maybe you're not living godly. Maybe you're backslidden. Maybe you need to get right with God. Because the more you choose to serve God, the more you live godly, the more you do for Jesus, the more suffering you will find. And usually it will be from others who claim to be Christians, but they're more like that crowd. They're trying to get you to do something, to follow them, to follow their law, to follow their, their teachings. And if you stand up and say, no, I can't follow that. I'm following Christ and the Bible. Oh, that makes the religious people mad. The lost religious crowd gets so angry with people who say, no, your religion doesn't save you. It's what Jesus did. So, all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Are you suffering any persecution? If not, then you must not be living godly in Christ Jesus. My wife and I, we've gone through a lot. We were hurt by other Christians who stood up and began to say lies about us. And they still say some lies about us. And why is it? Because we're putting all the focus and all the emphasis on this right here. And what are they doing? They're trying to count numbers. They're trying to get people into a group and exalt the group. And in the flesh say, look at all the great things we're doing. And they're not walking in the Spirit of God. I want to walk in the Spirit. I thank God that I'm free. I'm trusting in what Jesus did. I know I don't have to do anything. And I know, thank God, I know I don't have to follow men to get to heaven and have to do what they tell me to do. No, but that's why I suffer persecution. These people will persecute you when you preach the cross because the cross is an offense unto them. So, back to uh, Galatians chapter 3. It says, Have you suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? So verse 4, Is it in vain if it's for Christ? No, never. It's never in vain if what you're doing is doing for the Lord Jesus Christ. If you suffer for Him, the Bible says you'll get rewards. God offers rewards in heaven for the more we suffer for Him. Now verse 5. He therefore that ministereth, ministereth to you the Spirit, and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? That's a good question. He says, He that ministereth to you by the Spirit. So someone was ministering unto them that was saved, that had the Holy Spirit of God. And in that time, there were some miracles taking place. Now we've looked at this a little before, but we'll look at it again, that as the church age went on, it started mostly, it was only to Jews. And so there, it's a transition, this book of Acts. So there were miracles taking place. And what we'll find is that the apostles were the ones doing the miracles. Eventually, those miracles ceased. And we looked at that a little bit last time, but I think it's important to look at that again. We've got some denominations in the world today that claim that they can do miracles, and only they can do miracles, and you've got to come to them. And we see on television and other things these gigantic, um, we call them crusades, in which they stand up there with their microphone and put their hand on people and supposedly heal them and, and go, when people get filled with the Holy Spirit or whatever. That's a bunch of junk. That's not of God. Oh no, you blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Well, look at the video last time, last week. Now, that can't happen today. The blasphemy of the Holy Spirit can only happen when Jesus' time or in the future. So I'm not blaspheming the Holy Spirit of God. I'm telling you, God gave signs and wonders and miracles to the apostles, but those ceased. And today there's no signs or miracles from a man. I'm not saying that God can't heal. God can heal. But that gift that God gave to the apostles to be able to lay hands on people and heal them, that's not around today. Let me show you that. Uh, that will take a little bit of time. So let's get to that. First of all, let's go to 1 Corinthians 1.22. We're going to look at signs, tongues, miracles, wonders, the apostles, who they are, what they did, and whether or not there are apostles today, because there are no apostles today. The apostles were part of the early church, and there are no more apostles today. We only have one apostle today. That's our apostle Paul. So let's look at that. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. See, the Bible says that the Jews seek after a sign, but the Gentiles seek after wisdom. So in, in 1 Corinthians 1, 22, we read, For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. 
Now, I've told you, and we've got whole videos about this, how when the church started, it started to the Jews and then transitioned to Gentiles. Well, God always dealt with Israel, and Israel always demanded signs and miracles and wonders. But Gentiles don't need signs. You see, we're to live by faith and not by sight. But the Jews, because they lived so many years under the law in the flesh, they needed sight. So the Jews, God dealt with them in the beginning by sight, by miracles. So this verse is so important. 1 Corinthians 1.22, For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. Well, we that are Gentiles, all we have is the Word of God. We don't need miracles. We don't need to see signs and wonders. All we need to do is read the Word and believe it. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 22, there was a sign, and it was one of the greatest signs that God used with the Jews in the early church. And it was called tongues. 1 Corinthians 14, 22, Wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. I think that's so funny. You've got your Pentecostals and Charismatics today. And they all want to stand up and blabber, blah, 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 and say, oh, look how spiritual and great I am because I speak in tongues. And God says, well, tongues aren't for you that believe, they're for you that don't believe. So you claim to be a believer, it makes me wonder if you are, I don't know if any of those people are safe, but they say, well, we're believers, then why are you speaking in tongues? They're for Jews as a sign, and you're not a Jew, and they're for unsafe people, and you claim to be safe. So what are you doing flapping your mouth in tongues? Tongues are a sign, and tongues were a sign to the Jews. So when you go to the book of Acts, and you begin reading in the book of Acts, what happened in the book of Acts? Well, the book of Acts, it starts out, Jesus is resurrected, they see the Messiah, then they get together and start praying in Pentecost, then they receive the Holy Spirit, and then Peter goes out in chapter 2 and begins preaching. And guess what? He's preaching to Jews, and there's a miracle that takes place. But look at this. Let's go to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Now when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a mighty rushing wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. They were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So they spake, but now watch this. It says in verse 5, And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation. And then in verse 8, And how hear we every man in our own tongue when we were born. And it says in verse 6, Because they heard, every man heard them speak in his own language. So were they speaking in tongues? Well, it says they were beginning to speak in tongues. They spake with other tongues. So the miracle in Acts chapter 2 is that they began to speak in other tongues. And other people heard the tongue in their own language. Well, that's a miracle. For example, I speak English and Spanish. Now, if I all of a sudden started preaching in fluent German, and you were a German listening, that would be the miracle. That would be the equivalent of what happened in that time period. But I can't do that. And, I, and God the Holy Spirit wouldn't do that with me today, because when he did it to begin with, he did it only to Jews, so that the Jews would hear. But today, that doesn't take place. That has been phased out. So let's look at that. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 12, 27. This is so important, because you've got a whole denomination out there that believes in speaking in tongues. And yet they don't understand that the tongues was a, something the apostles did to the Jews, because the Jews needed a sign, and tongues were a sign. And it's something that eventually ceased. There's no speaking of tongues today as the miracle that was done in the book of Acts chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27. And it says, Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. And God had set some in the church. All right, watch this. First apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Well, the answer is no. So first were the apostles. And first were miracles and things like that. But those miracles ceased because it changed from Jews to Gentiles. And now there's no need to work miracles because now we're saved by hearing the gospel. If you remember last time, we looked at how important it is to hear and believe. It's not by seeing or by sight that we're saved. It's by faith. Faith coming by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So 1 Corinthians chapter 13 now and verse 8 through 10. 
First Corinthians 13, 8. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. So tongues shall cease. Well, they have ceased. Now, we speak in tongues today in the sense that I speak English and Spanish. Those are written, spoken languages. Those are tongues that we speak. But no one just starts talking in a different language that they themselves don't even know that someone else hears. That's the miracle that happened back then that no longer takes place today because tongues have ceased. You say, what is that that it's talking about? Then that which is perfect shall come, shall be done away. Well, that's the scriptures. When the scriptures became final and settled, this is it. We don't have God speaking down from heaven to us today. We don't have apostles that are telling us, well, this is what God says. Everything that God wants us to know is in the Bible. And that's what we read, because that's what's given to us. 2 Peter 1.19 tells us, 2 Peter chapter 1, and verse 19 says, we, also, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star rise in your heart. What does it mean, a more sure word of prophecy? Well, the context is God speaking from heaven in verse 17 and giving a voice in verse 18. So more sure than a voice from heaven, God speaking to you, is the Bible. It's the truth. And everything we need that God has given us today is from the King James Bible. We cannot go by, well, this guy over here is a prophet, and he said this and this and this. Or this guy claims to be an apostle, and he speaks and talking and claims to be... No, you can't go by that. You have to go by the scriptures. And according to the scriptures, the apostles practiced miracles and tongues, which were signs for the Jews. But as the church age extended and the book of Acts went on, those things ceased. And there aren't any miracles today. If there are, they might be from demons. And we'll look at that. But first of all, just to prove, and there's another video, I can't remember which one we did. It might have been in Thessalonians uh, about this where I showed even more verses about how this was lost. But I'll show a quick verse. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 20. Now the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts, he laid hands on people, he, he healed people, he rose people from the dead, same with Peter. Anybody that was sick, they healed them. So why in the last book that, P, that Paul ever wrote, does he say these words? In um, 2 Timothy 4.20, it says... Erastus abode at Corinth, but Trophimus have I left at Miletum sick. Why would the Apostle Paul leave somebody sick if he had the power as an Apostle and the ability of science to heal? Why would he leave somebody there? I'll put up here healing too. Well, the reason is those, those signs of the Apostles, they ended. They ceased. All this was back here in a transition time for the Jews. And now for the Gentiles, they don't seek for a sign, they go for faith. So eventually, those were lost. And Paul ended up losing his gift of healing. And he had to leave somebody, Trophimus, at Miletum, sick. So let's continue. Acts chapter 1. Let's go to Acts chapter 1. And here's a question. Are there apostles today? Well, according to the Bible, the apostles are gone. They're over, they're done. Our apostle is the apostle Paul, Romans 11, 13. So he's the only apostle that we're to follow today. But there are people out there that claim, well, I'm an apostle, or I'm an apostle. Are there apostles today? What would it take to become an apostle? How did a person become an apostle? Let's look at that. Acts chapter 1, and verse 12. In Acts chapter 1, and verse 12, it says, Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem a Sabbath day journey. So, they saw Jesus after he rose again, infallible proofs, verse 3. And then they are all returning from Mount Olivet, where Jesus rose up again into the heavens. And then they were coming to the upper room. And in verse 15, those days, Peter spoke up in the midst of the disciples. He stood up and he spoke. And he began to talk and talk and talk. And then he tells us that, um, verse 17, For he was numbered with us and hath obtained part of this ministry, talking about Judas and how Judas fell. And um, then he goes on, and he, he says, well, now it's time for us to pick up and determine who will be in his place. So they're looking for a new apostle in the place of Judas. 
And then he says in verse 20, For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, and let his bishopric, bishopric let another take. Wherefore, these men which have companied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto the same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. So there's three things there that have to take place for a person to be an apostle. First, they had to be with Jesus the, all the time the rest of the apostles were with Jesus. So the only thing, these are like, I guess you call them prerequisites of what it needs, or what a person needs to be an apostle. So these are prerequisites of an apostle. They had to be with Jesus all the time that the other apostles were with him. They also had to have been with Jesus from the time of John. So they probably would have had to have been baptized by John as well. And then what does it say? They had to have been witnesses of Jesus' resurrection. Alright, so according to this scripture here, for a person to be accepted as an apostle, they had to have been with Jesus all the time that he was here on earth. They had to have started from John, so even before Jesus. And they had to have been a witness of Jesus' resurrection. And so what they did is they got together and they prayed. And it says, And they appointed two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knoweth the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part of this ministry, okay, and apostleship, from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. So to be an apostle, according to the Bible, there were three things that had to take place. You had to have started with John, been with Jesus in all of his ministry, and been a witness of Jesus' resurrection. Is there anyone alive today that can qualify in all three of those points? Not a one. No one I know of that has lived about 2,000 years that have seen all of that. So this is what makes a person apostle. In that case, there are no apostles today, not one. Now when it comes to the apostle Paul, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He's one bit of an exception. But yet, he was alive during this time, so he can qualify, and he does. God chooses him. He must have gone out and seen John the Baptist. He must have seen Jesus in his ministry. I believe personally that Paul was there at the crucifixion and he saw Jesus die. And I know that Paul saw Jesus Christ at his resurrection. And we know in Acts chapter 9 that, that the crucified Jesus appeared unto Paul. So in, that, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in verse 8, Paul says, And last of all, he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, and not me to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the grace of God. He said, I was born out of due time. So God allowed Paul to come out here and be the last apostle. Even though he didn't feel that he was even worthy to be one. But he was an apostle. And was he an apostle? Of course. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 1.1. 1, 1. 2 Corinthians 1.1. 1, 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Galatians 1.1, 1, 1, Colossians 1.1, 1, 1, Ephesians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul starts out, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. So Paul is an apostle. He's one of the twelve. But Paul is our apostle according to Romans 11.13. So I've told you and I've taught you right that when God started out, he started out with these twelve apostles doing signs and miracles, speaking in tongues, doing healing, and it was for the Jews. And then as the book of Acts continued on, which is a book of transition, it transitioned to the Gentiles, and slowly these miracles ceased. These tongues ceased. The healing ceased. Paul left someone sick somewhere because he could no longer heal him. And so who is our apostle today? It's Paul. Paul is our apostle to the Gentiles. It's so important that people understand that. Now, are there apostles today? Well... Well, before we go back to that, let's go to 2 Corinthians 12.12, 12, since we're in Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 12.12, 12, those signs, those miracles, those tongues, they're what you call signs of an apostle. 2 Corinthians 12.12, 12, Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. 
So this is what we're called the signs of an apostle. This speaking in tongues, these healing, these miracles, all that were what were called the signs of the apostles. And we see the transition from the Jews to the Gentiles, and we see that petering out, or we see that transition taking place, and these signs of the apostles coming to an end. And then God choosing Paul, going straight to the Gentiles, and no more healing, no more speaking in tongues, no more miracles. So, are there people today that can call themselves apostles? Oh, let's look at that. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 13. When the Bible tells us about apostles after Paul, every time someone's mentioned in the Bible that claims to be an apostle after Paul, they are always a false apostle. And they're working miracles, but not by the Spirit of God, but by the Spirit of Satan. So you better watch out if someone calls himself an apostle. You better watch out if someone says, I can do a miracle, because they're most likely from the devil doing signs and wonders under the power of Satan. Let's look at that. 2 Corinthians 11, 13. Paul says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves in the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. So what you have here is you have a setup in which God transitioned to the Gentiles. There's no more miracles or signs. There's no more apostles. But yet, there can people pop up and say, oh, I'm an apostle. And the Bible calls them false apostles. So anyone today who claims, I'm an apostle and I have signs and miracles, he is a false apostle and you better not follow him. Because our apostle today is still Paul. And anyone else that shows up, he is a liar and a minister of Satan according to these verses. That's what Paul tells us. Now let's look at Revelation. Because in the book of Revelation, we're told that in the last days, up show a bunch of people that claim to be apostles. And up show a bunch of people who have power to do miracles. And guess who sends them? Satan. And guess who they are? They're devils. So these false apostles do their works and their signs not by God's spirit, but by the spirit of unclean spirits, by Satan. So we'll go to Galatians, I mean, excuse me, Revelation chapter 13 and verse 12. It's talking about the beast, and it says, And he exercised all the power of the first beast before him, and caused the earth and them that would dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So there we see the, the gift of healing used by Satan to heal the Antichrist and bring him back to life. And he doeth great wonders, so that he make fire come down from heaven and the earth in the sight of all men. And deceiveth them, I'm in verse 14, that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth and do, do that, that they should make an image to the beast. Okay, and continue to go on. So there are signs of healings and miracles in the last days, in the tribulation period. And it's all done by Satan. And he has his false apostles that work signs and miracles. Revelation chapter 16 and verse 14. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world and gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. What battle is that? Battle of Armageddon. So the context is here. But even in the end of the church age we see a day of apostasy. The Bible says they'll give heed to devils and seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. We'll start seeing those miracles even before the rapture, I believe, as these false people, false prophets, false apostles will stand up and say, well, we're ministers of God, look what we can do, and they'll deceive many. In Revelation 19, 20, And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These boasts were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. So a false prophet... So you have false apostles, you have a false prophet. Oh, I'm about to do it in Spanish, false prophet. And you have false signs, miracles, healings, and they're all done by the wrong spirit. So if you're a Pentecostal or it's charismatic and you believe that these signs are still going on today, you're not reading your Bible. You haven't realized, hey, those were only for the apostles. They're called signs of apostles, and they cease. They're no longer... And if you claim to be a Christian and you're starting to see this then you see how you can so easily be swayed into following Satan? 
there's a famous TV guy named Benny Chicken. I won't say his real name, but he's on TV and he claims to be able to heal people. I've seen some of the stuff that he claimed to do. And I say, if that man really has that power, then why isn't he in every hospital in America, going room by room and healing everybody? Well, if he has the power, then he has it from the devil, not from God. And if he doesn't have that power, then he's lying and deceiving people into thinking he can heal them. I've heard of many of these people that have these so-called healing um, crusades, how they pay people beforehand and say, hey, I'll give you 40 bucks if you pretend to be in a wheelchair. And I've heard testimonies of people that have gone there and they say, well, I did that. And they told me to give me 40 bucks if I pretended to get healed out of a wheelchair, and so I did it. And I said, how could you do that? And they said, well, they told me it would strengthen people's faith if I did that. Okay, so you're lying in order to strengthen people's faith. How can that be true? How can that be right? It's not. Watch out for these people that claim to be apostles and have the gifts of healing and all these other ministries of miracles. Because according to the Bible, Paul is our apostle, and we are no longer under a time of ministry of healing, a ministry of tongues, a ministry of miracles. We are under faith, not sight. But in the future, false miracles and signs are coming. Okay, so let's go back to Galatians. I hope that made sense. Um, kind of got off subject here a little bit. But let's go back to Galatians. I just want people to not be deceived because I came out of a Pentecostal charismatic background um, and I was deceived for many years. And you know one of the things that they teach in the Pentecostal church, and we kind of looked at it last time, is that you can, you can be saved by faith, they say, but when you get saved you don't have the Holy Spirit. And the Pentecostals teach that you can only receive the Holy Spirit by speaking in tongues. And so they say, well, if you'll speak in tongues, then you'll get the Holy Spirit of God to come inside you. Well, that's not what the Bible teaches. We looked at it last time that according to Ephesians 1.13, as soon as you trust the, the gospel, that's when you receive the Holy Spirit. So why would they lie? Well, because they're reading the book of Acts and they don't even see the transition. So they're thinking, oh, we can get the Holy Spirit by speaking in tongues just like they did. Who's they? The early apostles. So I'm thankful that I'm not in that um, false denomination anymore. I'm thankful that I've learned the truth and that I know that I'm saved and I know that I have eternal life. Because they told me, oh, you can lose it. So my whole life I was, oh, I don't want to lose it. I've got to do right. And I was thinking I've got to do works to get saved. So I'm so thankful that my dad sat down and told me the truth and told me how to be saved. And I'm just so glad that I've got salvation, that I know it, that I can rightly divide the, the Word of God, that I know what it's talking about, and that I know where we are today, and that we're following Paul. So go back to Galatians chapter 3 <clears throat> and verse 5. He therefore that ministereth to, you, ministereth to you the Spirit, and worketh miracles among you, doeth he hid by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Okay, so at that time, and not today, but back at that time where Paul existed, there was someone doing miracles. And the question was, do those miracles come by doing the law in the flesh or by the Spirit? Well, no one back there did any miracles based upon their own righteousness of keeping the law. They were in the flesh. But when God gave them their Holy Spirit, God worked through them to the early Jews in the church and used those miracles to show people that Jesus Christ was God. But those miracles are over. We don't need those today. Verse 6. Even as Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. So Abraham believed God, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. Now, we looked at this. We've got a sermon. I believe it's called uh, Dispensational Salvation. Go to past sermons. Look up Dispensational Salvation. Uh, also, Old Testament versus New Testament Salvation. Those two videos talk about this for a little bit. Because it says right here, Abraham believed God. Abraham's back here. Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. So by his faith or by believing God, God imputed unto him his righteousness. Now also on the cloudchurch.org we have a video, past sermon, on imputed righteousness. I recommend looking that up to learn more about what imputed righteousness is. But even though that he got imputed righteousness by believing, Abraham didn't get saved like we do today. Abraham was justified by his works, the Bible tells us later. We're not justified by works, we're justified by faith. So there are differences between the Old Testament and the New Testament. For example, Abraham is saved by grace through faith in the Old Testament by believing, 
but he is not regenerated like we are today. When we get saved today, we are regenerated. We have a new nature. We have the Holy Spirit. We are spiritually circumcised. Well, Abraham wasn't. He was physically in the flesh, but we are spiritually today. Today, when we get saved, we are adopted. Abraham wasn't adopted. We're today, we're justified. We're sealed with the Holy Spirit of God today when we believe. Abraham wasn't sealed with the Holy Spirit of God back then when he believed. So you can't say that salvation is the same in the Old Testament as it is in the New Testament. That's ridiculous. Yes, there are types in the Old Testament. And what we see is if we go back and we look at Adam, we look at Abraham, we look at Moses, we look at all these Old Testament, we see a lot of types of things that will come in the future. future. But still, it's different. And one of the biggest differences in the Old Testament is it's all about doing things in the flesh. And here it's all about being saved and living in the Spirit because we receive the Holy Spirit of God and we're sealed with Him and He can't leave. Now, it's talked about Abraham believed God and is counted him for righteousness. This is found in Genesis 15, 6. So it would do good to, to look back at that verse where it's quoting from. And in Genesis 15, 6 we read, And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. So it says Abraham believed God in Galatians. And in the Old Testament it says Abraham believed in the Lord. So who is the Lord? The Lord is God. Well, who is God? The Lord. Well, it's interesting that it calls Jesus Christ the Lord Jesus Christ. So the same Lord of the Old Testament, Jesus, is the same Lord of the New Testament. And that's so important because we have people called Jehovah Witnesses that go around and try to put people into the law and try to tell people, oh, you can live over here in a kingdom without telling them anything in between. And what do they do? They tell you that Jesus Christ isn't a God or a God at all. He's just a, a lesser born son of God. And they attack the deity of Jesus Christ. But Jesus Christ is God. He's part of the Trinity. The Trinity is three parts. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So did God exist? Did Jesus Christ exist before he was born? Yes, he existed in a pre-bodily um, pre state. And I believe that the Bible talks about the priest of Melchizedek. That was Jesus Christ, was Melchizedek. Melchizedek showed up to... Um, Abraham in that time. And Abraham offered sacrifices to Melchizedek. So Jesus existed before he came born of a virgin. He just had a, a pre-incarnate body, if you will. But then he came in this body. And now in heaven, he's in this same body that he died and was buried and rose again. That's a different teaching. I don't know why I got off on that. So Galatians chapter 3, 6, Even as Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now see what he did? It almost doesn't make sense from verse 5 to verse 6. Verse 5 says, He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you, doeth he by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? That's a question. Well, he should answer it. He should say, of course, it's by faith. But instead of that, he just says, Even as Abraham believed God, it was counted on him for righteousness. So he's saying, look, you remember how Abraham was saved by believing? That's how we're saved today, by believing. So then there is a difference between believing for salvation and working the law for salvation. And that is so plain in Galatians 2.16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even though I have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. So there is a difference. And if you are a Christian, you need to know the difference. We are not under the law, we're under grace. We're not saved by works, which is what the law teaches, working in the flesh. We're saved by believing and trusting the gospel, and then we receive the Holy Spirit. How can someone claim to be a Christian and still try to put people under the law? Well, that's what the whole book of Galatians is about. Now let's go get, look at uh, verse 7. Know ye therefore that they which are of the faith, the same are the children of Abraham? In the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, And these shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Wow, there's so much in these verses. But um, here's the word gospel means good news. So whenever you see the term gospel, most often we all think, Oh, gospel, isn't that 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4? Well, the gospel for us for salvation today is 1 Corinthians 15. But when it's talking about the gospel here, it's talking about the good news. 
Because the gospel of 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4 wasn't preached to Abraham. Now in type, it was. If you remember here a couple uh, episodes back, how we were talking about what God told uh, Moses, I mean, excuse me, Abraham to do. And how Abraham was told to take his son, his only begotten son Isaac, take a knife and try to kill him. And how Isaac was believing that he would rise again. So we see a type of this gospel, of a death, burial, and resurrection. But Abraham knew nothing about Jesus Christ coming, dying on the cross, being buried, and rose again. So what was Abraham trusting in? Was Abraham trusting in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ? How could he be trusting in something that hadn't taken place yet? He didn't even know that Jesus would come to a cross. The cross came many years later with the Romans. The Romans were the first ones to take a cross and crucify people on a cross. So there are people that say, well, people are saying the same in the Old Testament as the New Testament. That's not true. It's not the same. And so when we read the gospel unto Abraham, it's the good news unto Abraham, and then it tells us what that gospel or the good news that was preached to Abraham is. In thee shall all nations be blessed. So all throughout the Bible, people were saved by just simply trusting in what God told them to do at the time. And God told Adam, don't eat of the tree. And then we can look at this on, uh, go to the cloudchurch.org, past sermons, dispensational salvation, and we'll look into that a lot deeper. But how are we saved today? Trusting the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But what is it talking about here when it says, preach before the gospel? That's not this gospel. It can't be because this hasn't taken place yet. So it defines what the good news or the gospel is to Abraham. And it says it right there, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So the good news or the gospel that God preached to Abraham was, In you all nations will be blessed. How are they blessed? Verse 9, So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Now, God promised Abraham a seed. So here's Abraham, and the seed that came out of him was these Jews, literal Jews in the flesh. So the Jewish race, or Israel, all came from Abraham. But then it says, in these shall all nations. Well, Israel is just one nation. There are other nations. There's these Gentile nations out here. How are we blessed through him? Well, when we believe in Jesus Christ, a Jew who comes all the way back from the line of Abraham, then we get in spiritually, and we become what the Bible calls spiritual Jews. Now that's a long thing to get into. I'm sure as we go farther along in this book, we'll eventually get into that. So I will uh, kind of go over that real quick, and um, pass over it, I mean, and we'll look at that, that later. Um, but it's just so important to see that God blessed Abraham. So, verse 8. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham saying, and these shall all nations be blessed. So the scripture, the Bible, it was God seeing before that the heathen, which is us Gentiles, would be justified through faith. So even back then in the mind of God out here in the future, he had a plan to save us ungodly Gentiles through faith. And then in verse 9, So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. So we are blessed by faith, just as Abraham was blessed in the Old Testament. And now verse 10, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. Listen to this. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. So according to the Bible, this right here, is a gigantic curse. So do you understand now what's going on? When these people came into the church in Galatians and tried to say, no, you got to go back under the law. You know what they're trying to do? They're trying to curse them. And who is who's known for cursing people? Witches. They use say, uh, 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 magic to try to curse people and put them under curses. And hexes, they call it. So Paul says in Galatians chapter 3, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you. The law, the Old Testament law, is a curse. Why is it a curse? Because when you put yourself under that law, you say, I'm going to do everything in that law. And if I offend it in just one point, I'm cursed. Who would want to put themselves under such a thing to where if you just screw up one time, you're completely cursed? I wouldn't want to live like that. 
Well, thank God we're not under the law. And I've shown you before, and let's go ahead and look at it again. This is such a powerful verse. Romans chapter 10 and verse 4. Um, are we under the law as Christians? No. For Christ is the end of the law to, for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Romans 10, 4. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live in them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. So faith is what saves us, and not the law. Christ is the end of the law. These people that say they're Christians and say you've got to keep the law are trying to get you under a curse. Who wants to be cursed? The law is a curse because you must obey it in all. And if you, if you, find, if you try to find this, or try to do this, then you'll find that that is utterly impossible. And what an interesting, interesting thing about the Old Testament, there are 39 books in the Old Testament. 39 is 13 plus 13 plus 13. That's 39. You know, 13 isn't really a good number, is it? <laughs> And uh, we think of the number 13, we think, oh, that's an awful number. Well, the law is 13, 13, 13, or 39. So, verse 11. But that no man is justified in the sight of the law of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Well, duh, it's evident to thus those that are saved that no one can be justified by the law. And yet, Galatians 2.16, no other man is not saved by the just, you know, it's, no other man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we believe in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ. Why do people try to put others under the law for salvation? We are not saved. We are not justified by the law. Uh, verse 12, And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. So those that are under the law must obey the law. We just saw that in verse 10. Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all the things which are written in the book of the law to do them. I had a guy tell me one time, I just don't see works, how the law is works. Okay, well he said, you're cursed if you don't do them. All the things. Does that not sound like a work set up to you? And it says, it is evident that you are not, the just shall live by faith, and the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them, shall live in them. So the law is not a faith. There's no faith over here in the law. So what is it? If it's not faith, it's works. Now we're saved by faith, not works. So people, why do they try to take this and put it over here and say, no, it's faith plus works? It's not. We're not saved by the law, nor are we saved and kept saved by the law. We're saved by faith. It's one, either or, one or the other. Okay, so continue on. Verse 13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. And that's interesting that the law is a curse, and Jesus Christ became a curse for us, because he hung himself on a tree. So he took the curse on him. He paid for our sins. He took away the curse. He was buried, rose again the third day, and now he's in heaven. And that curse is behind us. We're not a part of that. We're not saved by that. Anyone who tries to get back under the law is cursing themselves and spitting on God and saying, I don't care what you did. It's not important to me. But yet that's the only way to be saved is by trusting what Jesus did. So we'll continue um, in verse 14 and we'll stop there. That the blessing of Abraham, it says, might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So when do we receive the Spirit of God? It's by faith. It's not like I told you earlier, by speaking in tongues, like that false religious denomination deceived me into thinking. As soon as you believe and you trust, after you heard the word of truth, you receive the Holy Spirit. And the promise of the Spirit comes to us by faith. And uh, we receive the blessing of Abraham through faith when we're saved. So let's go ahead and stop there in verse 14. <clears throat> I guess next time we'll, we'll attempt to finish uh, chapter 3 of Galatians. But I just hope that, um, that you understand this chapter. This chapter here is one of the greatest chapters that proves we're not saved by the law. Because we don't receive the Spirit by the law. Um, if we get saved, then those that try to keep the law will persecute us and we'll end up suffering for what we believe. Um, we keep this because this is grace. This is a curse. And how do we receive the Holy Spirit? By faith. We don't receive the Spirit by, by works. It's one of the best chapters there is to show 
that were not under the law. And verse 13 is so great. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. Over here, we are saved, we are redeemed. We have redemption through His blood. So it's so important to understand this. And, you know, if you're saved, this might seem remedial and, and boring. But there are so many people out there that believe they have to keep the law to be saved. And it's so good to learn this so you can show them, no, 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 look what the Bible says. Because there's liberty, there's freedom, there's blessings in Christ. And you can't be blessed under the law. So these people that are trying to live under the law, they don't have any blessings. And yet, Paul says we have all spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus when we're saved. So what do you want, the law or grace? I'll take grace. Because that's over. Jesus paid for that. He redeemed us from that. That's a curse. And he said he's the end of the law. So thank God we're under grace and we're saved by trusting Jesus Christ alone, not anything that we do to get us to heaven. So I appreciate you watching this week. Next time we'll, we'll start there in verse about 15 and uh, see if we can't um, do a little bit better. Sorry I'm a little under the weather. <clears throat> I noticed as I started my voice was starting to go out and starting to feel a little weak. So hopefully next time I'll be in better shape and be able to do a better job. So I appreciate it. God bless you and have a good one.